Nell C is my colleague and co-chair of the Education Committee. She's chairman of the Neurosurgic Pediatric Neurosurgical Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgeons. She's the chair of the Committee of Women in Neurosurgery in Brazil. And in fact, she has so many other designations that we would spend the next half an hour if I were to recite them. But Nelsi is an amazing lady, a great friend, and somebody I've always admired in pediatric neurosurgery. So over to Nelsi to conduct the proceedings and make sure there's not too much bloodshed. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for these kind words. It's a great privilege to be here and privilege to work with you. Uh, welcome everyone, it's a, a good option to meet each other online and I have the privilege to introduce you these two big friends and professor, well known around the world. Adam Caceres is a pediatric neurosurgeon and professor at the University of Costa Rica and Professor Wan Tiu is a pediatric neurosurgeon from Singapore and he will host the next meeting, 2021. It will be a great pleasure, pleasure to, to see you all there. And uh, now we expect this debate anxiously. Sure, we will learn and uh, it's yours. We may start with Adrian, is correct? Yes, so I will share my screen now. Please let me know if you're able to see this. Okay. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank everybody who has made some space in their time to watch this uh, educational activity. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and Good evening to everyone around the world. Um, I would like, like to start my uh, debate saying that we have no financial relationships or interests related to the content of this activity. And very important, many of the information that you will hear today <clears throat> is uh, preliminary and awaiting publication. So please uh, do not reproduce it. Uh, it'll come out really soon in, in print. So we're, we're working on this now. So the purpose of my talk today is to make a case based on the following premises. Okay, hold on. So folate fortification is effective because it decreases the total number of cases that we see. It decreases the severity of the cases that we still get to see. It's an economically viable activity. And it should be part of every sustainable development national policy. And most important, it's safe and it's ethically mandatory to conduct fortification. As you all know, there's an average of 300,000 live births worthwhile every year with neural tube defects. So the incidence is about 2.5 per 10,000 live births. <clears throat> that means that uh, in the USA, there's about 1,500 kids a year that are born. And of course, there's an unknown number of miscarriages, stillbirths, and those who choose abortion. It is one of the uh, an elevated cause of mortality, disability, in children and young adults. And it's unknown the expenditure in healthcare costs in adulthood, because uh, you know, in most countries there's issues with transition of care. So over the years I have come to realize, and this is, remember this, neural tube defects are the most severe congenital malformations that are compatible with life. You have a big time cardiac defect, you either die uh, at birth or shortly following thereafter. You know, surgery has uh, fixed many of these things, but it is the most severe congenital malformation, even if untreated, that it's compatible with life. So 
It should be compared to a chronic high-risk disease because of hydrocephalus, renal failure. These patients are prone to fractures and soft tissue ulcers and infections. Many of them develop restrictive pulmonary disease secondary to scoliosis. And of course, they have many quality of life issues in the psychosocial arena. So my first point, folic acid fortification is effective. Okay, so I will elaborate on that. This is Lucy Willis. Lucy Willis was a, a, a British national, uh, one of the first women that uh, trained in medicine and headed off to India. And she started to study um, anemia in pregnant women in, in, uh, in India. And soon thereafter, she found out that extracts from yeast would, uh, would cure this uh, megalocytic anemia. And the compound that she came up with was marmite, which is a yeast extract. Well, it was rich in B vitamins, especially in folate. And um, because of her early work, we began to understood the very complex uh, mechanisms that folate has in the DNA synthesis, and um, especially the relationship which is between homocysteine, methionine, and folate which are essential for DNA methylation. As you all know, we know that uh, the prevention of neural tube defects uh, has been quoted in between 6 to up to 92%. And you can drop significantly after you start folate fortification. The main neurulation defects that we have are myelomeningocele and an encephaly that can be prevented by folate fortification. And you might uh, ask yourself, well, why is folate not preventing every single one? Well, we know that there are some other mechanisms that are not dependable on folate. Um, there can be autoantibodies, again, folate binding receptors. Um, also, the synthesis of thimidylate, which is regulated by the Pax3 gene, and some other um, genetic knockouts, which basically target the tetrahydrofolate enzyme uh, compound. So basically in 1964, Hubbard showed the first evidence of relationship between folate and, and um, neural tube defects. And the British Medical Council in 83 uh, found out that there was a 72% protection factor. And other studies show a, a reduction of at least 50%. <clears throat> Many of the studies of Smithels and Shepard also showed um, the advantages of fortification with folic acid. So these are the first numbers that came out of the USA where it was uh, shown that there was a significant decrease in the number of neural tube defects. This is also a study that came out of Canada. And slowly, there was a buildup of evidence that folate was actually a good thing to prevent uh, spina bifida. So in 1992, the United States Public Health Service recommended that every woman in the fertile age should take at least 400 micrograms of, day of folate, but less than 20% of the women took folate in order to, you know, willingly before um, as a part of planning their, um, their pregnancy. So the next option was to fortificate uh, cereals with 140 micrograms uh, of grain. And the UK recommended going to 240, but this fortification was never implemented in the, in the UK. We'll go on to that later on. <clears throat> so very important, some wrongful assumptions that people make around folate acid. So a woman who is in childbearing age might think, okay, I will plan my pregnancy and will take folate as part of my planned parenting. So less than 20% actually do that, even in, in developed countries. Second, as soon as I find out that I'm pregnant, I will start taking folate to prevent neural tube defects. Well, that's a, another wrongful assumption because by the time the menses do not show up, the neural tube has already undergone closure. And if there is a defect, caudal or cranial, it will already happen by that. And then strangely enough, some uh, assumption would be, I don't want to take any acid that surely will hurt my unborn child. David McClone, one of my mentors, uh, actually told me that they had to change 
uh, the glossary of how this was uh, promoted. Because many women that uh, were coming out of the 70s and you know that the acids that were used during the hippie era were actually afraid to take an acid that would, would hurt their baby in the womb. So the term of folic acid was quickly switched to folate and that was more socially acceptable. And then the last wrongful assumption that neural tube diseases are found in impoverished areas of the world. Well, they're not. They're actually found worldwide. We know they're actually related to events in which poverty is found, but uh, it's found everywhere. So this is a map which shows the countries where folate fortification is mandatory. And of course, it will be a, a big surprise to many that most of Europe is out of the picture. China is out of the picture and a lot of countries in the Far East. These are the combinations of how we fortify um, wheat, which is shown in red. In green, we're showing wheat flour and maize. In orange, wheat flour and rice. In blue, wheat flour, maize flour and rice, and uh, yellow, just rice. So I will talk a little bit about my small country. So Costa Rica is a, is a very small country that's situated in the middle of the American continent. We have around 4.9, I would say, million inhabitants. And 98% of all the pregnancies are delivered in screen hospitals. We have a very stable population. So there is immigration into Costa Rica, but very little outside Costa Rica. Now, there is no legal abortion, and abortion is usually not a common option for Costa Rican women. Even if they're offered this choice, they will choose to have their child. And we have a public health system that's universal with free healthcare for all pregnant women, so there's no excuse. And every single a uh, child that's born with a neural tube defect is evaluated, treated, operated, and followed at a single central children's hospital. So uh, this is very important, and I always like to, to point this out, that uh, very few countries have the ability to have every single child with a neurosurgical disease treated at a single center. In my country, no adult neurosurgeon will operate on a child uh, with any neurosurgical illness. They, every single child comes to us. And also all the produce that's produced in Costa Rica is centrally retrieved, is fortified, and then returned to the population. So very little self-sustainable uh, uh, economies. Everything, rice and maize, is basically retrieved, fortified, and then returned to the population. So the two key elements of this uh, policy are the National Children's Hospital and in science of which is uh, a, a very commendable governmental agency, which is uh, a research and teaching institute on nutrition and health. So in 1996, there was a national survey that showed that the folate deficiency was actually 24.7% in child very aged women. How did we do this? Well, basically we went out and sampled the blood of women in childbearing age, both in a rural and urban uh, environment. And we found that pre-fortification, 31% of, of women had folate deficiency and almost 20% in an urban setting. Well, once that folate fortification was established, we found that that rural changed from 31 to 11 and urban from 20 almost to 2.5%. So by 2008, the survey was again repeated and there was just a 3.8% deficiency in folic acid levels. So we wanted to know how were the nutritional patterns. This is very important whenever you want to plan out how to fortify with flour. As you can see, Costa Rica actually consumes the yellow area is wheat flour and the orange bars are maize flours. So as you can see in Costa Rica, most of the flour which is consumed is wheat and not corn, as opposed to Guatemala, for instance, which has a, a very strong 
Mayan influence and where uh, corn is the main flower that's consumed. So you want to plan out that and start with what people eat the most. So there was an executive degree that there, this was a bill that was passed in Congress, which decreed that wheat flour would be uh, enriched first, and then subsequent decrees actually enriched corn flour, all dairy products, and there was even an increase in the levels on wheat flour. So wheat flour, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, cornmeal, 1.3, milk, 40 micrograms per 250 milliliters, and 1.8 milligrams per kilogram for, for rice. So this is, this is probably the money shot uh, slide that I have to show you. So check this, in 1987, the rate was 3.7, it dropped to 1.45, so it was a 61% decrease in an encephaly. Encephalocele also dropped 38%, but look at this. Myelomeningocele in a couple of years actually turned from 7.3 to 3.3, which is a 55% decrease in the number of uh, myelomeningocele patients. And this effect was not just an observational effect, but, but was actually a tendency that actually continued to drop over the years and has been sustained. So in this picture, we can see how wheat flour, cornmeal, milk, and rice, all of them in conjunction led to a drop. We can see some rises that can be related to many factors. Sometimes these are related to humanitarian crises that go on in our neighboring country, Nicaragua, and we have patients that immigrate into this country, and some of them will harbor kids with spina bifida, so that uh, certainly adds up to the numbers. Um, but yes, every single one of them actually kept dropping and was sustained. Now, very interesting, not only we decrease the number of patients, but the myelomeningocils caudalize themselves. What do I mean with this? That not only the anatomic, but functional levels actually went caudal. There was a decrease in the defect diameter. And I can assure you, probably in some areas of the world, this is hard to believe, but in the last 20 years, I could almost count with one hand the number of kyphotic deformities I have gotten to see. Right when I started, I was taught that you should perform kyphectomy in these kids. Well, I never had to perform this operation because we just don't see them. 40% of these kids in the series, as we have the 20 year data, have become shunt independent. And now with neuroendoscopy, we think that we are even shunting even lesser kids. So less patients require a shunt at birth. And also, it is very rare in our experience to see a kid who's born with a symptomatic Chiari. It's almost non-existent. And those who do that get operated actually do not improve. And we believe this is uh, part of, of the integral um, theory that was postulated by McClone. So there is um, a, a wrong hardwiring of the, of the cranial nerves. Also, we just took out the numbers for the 20 years and we saw leukemia is the green bar. There was no change in the incidence of leukemia after folate. This is some of, of the things that have been ex speculated that could be increased. So we saw no significant increase in the, in the numbers of leukemia in childhood from kids from zero to 15. So you will see here in this bar, that the pre-folate numbers are the blue ones, the post-folate are the orange ones. Back then, there was a significant number of thoracic myelomeningocils, which are very little right now. And of course, since we don't have that many um, thoracic myelomeningocils, there was a significant increase in lumbar and sacral. The orange ones actually increased after folate. And look at this, 
the diameter of the neural tube defect after the folate actually became lesser. So most of the defects that we get to see are in the four to six centimeter diameter range. These are the typical myelum and ingocils that we get to see, the one on the far left, a very small one. Uh, and the one on the right, I would say it's one of the most extreme that we get to see, but the important message here is that most of the myelum and ingocils that we see are L3 and below. Of course, back in the day, almost every single kid received a shunt and kept the shunt for the rest of his life. As years have gone by, these numbers have decreased. And nowadays with endoscopy, I would say we're getting closer to 50%. Uh, one of the things that are debatable is whether we're tolerating bigger bends now that uh, endoscopy is being offered. And this is an ongoing debate, but sure enough, I think endoscopy has done a great deal to fix kids with uh, hydrocephalus related to neural tube defects. So, what did we learn from these policies? That we should standardize the surveillance of birth defects. In CNSA is an org uh, a government organization that actually overlooks that these partnerships that we establish with public and private health providers uh, are solid and that their executive mandates to enrich several staples and that we should inspect and vigilate the compliance of fortification. Every single industrial uh, company will try to save, even if it's a few bucks, but they will try to do it. So there's, there should always be compliance and vigilance that the fortification is, is ongoing. And we need to survey blood levels of folate, and we, we should start to learn more about these uh, knockout variants that contribute to the cases that still appear. So it's a teamwork of several agencies and disciplines. So what are the economics be between uh, fortification of folate? We know that every single child that is born with myelomeningocele in the USA represents $1.4 million in the United States and almost 500,000 euros. That's the lifetime cost. 37% are direct medical costs. And the complications that are associated with myelomeningocele, a shunt infection, every single one of them, is costs around $50,000. We tend to forget in our countries where we have social health care, the price and the boarding of an infected shunt. And we know that an infected shunt is probably one of the most important determinants of IQ for these kids. But not only the price is paid in neurons, it's paid in big, big dollars. Hemodialysis, it has a cost of $90,000 per year. Kidney transplant, now we're talking about $400,000. Spinal instrumentation, $140,000. So you can keep on adding up the money that's spent on every single child that's born with spina bifida that could have been prevented by folate. This study conducted in Italy shows that from zero to four years, you spend an average, parents spend an average of 13,000 euros per year. In between five to 17, 11,000 euros, and 18 and plus, 10,000 euros per year. So having uh, spina bifida is a very costly endeavor. And look at this. So if, if you want to fortify one kilogram of premix, which is worth $2, and you fortify it with, uh, with folate, the cost of one kilogram of enriched rice is 1.13. So actually fortifying this, you actually spend just 0.9% of the cost. Uh, it's really, really cheap. So fortification in the USA is between $1.5 to $3 per ton of wheat flour. So that the, the amount that's spent to prevent this is ridiculously small. And it has been demonstrated in a study in Chile that the cost of annual fortification is covered just by the prevention of two cases. So the CDC actually calculates that in between 400 to 600 
million dollars are saved each year just by fortification. This is very important in, in countries which have very low uh, income per capita. And we know that there are key factors in the fortification policy, such as economical, a political will, Congress and law directives, oversight by agencies, law abiding industry, promoting consumption of fortified goods, and free access to healthcare. For instance, it was surprising for me to find out that even in the United States, uh, there is this company which is called Maseca. Maseca is a company that delivers maize corn products uh, that are mostly consumed by Latinos in the United States. Well, these products were not fortified. Maseca was cut in corners. And because of the surveillance, now this population of Latinos living in the United States which many of them do not have proper access to healthcare, now are covered by folate fortification. So you always have to keep an eye out on the industry. So what about folate deficiency in Europe? It, it has been said that in Germany, there's an average intake in between 230 and 280 micrograms per day. And 50% have a folate intake that it's almost less than 100 micrograms. So 8.6 women have sufficient folate intake, including vitamins. Uh, it has been shown that 22% of pregnant women smoked in Germany. This uh, is correlated with low levels of folate. And only 17% in Germany, you know, they, uh, they will uh, take voluntary folate. So what happens with the Netherlands? They have an, an average, again, from 230 to 280. And educational programs and measures achieve only 30 to 42 preconception intake of folate after 10 years. So the impact, even though uh, these are first world countries, voluntary taking of folate is not enough. And 42% of men and 54% of women did not meet the recommendations of uh, folate uh, for children and adults. So the AeroCAT study said there was a progressive increase of neural tube defects in in, in Germany from 1576 to 16.4 per 10,000 uh, 10, live births. And these translates to 800 neural tube defects per year, 50 of whom at least could have been prevented with folic acid. And you might say that these kids were not born, but still there was an expenditure that um, was needed in order to um, perform abortion of, of, of these children. So, Folate is so much cheaper than dealing with uh, these kind of uh, outcomes. Also, we know that when you supplement, there is a prevention of recurrence, uh, which has been shown in, in several studies. So not only you prevent a family from bearing a, a child with spina bifida, you can also prevent them to experience the situation twice. Now let's go to some ethics. These are some of the gentlemen which early on in my career gave great words of advice from which I learned. This is Dr. Robert Michael Scott at uh, Boston Children's, Professor Jerry Oakes at Alabama Children's, and of course, David McClone, my great mentor and professor, who taught me mostly all of the stuff that I know about folate. Every single one of them marked out the importance of prevention and look at this picture. This is the picture of a child which was born in the UK and was told that she would not survive um, more than a few minutes after being born. And this was back in the 60s. She was operated by this uh, fellow. He was a pediatric surgeon who had great expertise in the treatment of myelomeningocele back in the day where pediatric neurosurgery was still something rare. And the picture on the far right is that same lady 60 years later. So there was a, a slow change in the attitude. These children were not being left untreated. Um, it was realized that there were so many things to offer and that myelomeningocele was not a devastating disease, that most of these kids, if treated adequately, would reach a meaningful life. So back in the day, there were the so-called Lorber criteria. Most of us did not get to practice under this criteria, but it, it was said that kids that were born with severe paraplegia, 
extreme macrocephaly who were grossly kyphotic or who had gross congenital abnormalities should be not treated? Well, guess what? We actually defeated those criteria for good because average level in Costa Rica is L3 and below. So most patients ambulate with orthesis. Only 60% nowadays require shunting. We don't have extreme macrocephaly anymore. Kyphosis is less than 1% in our series and less than 5% will have gross congenital abnormalities and symptomatic Chiari at birth is less than 3%. So we, did, we have already defeated those criteria. There was also a, a protocol that was established in the Netherlands, very interesting to read, a lot of debate around this. And it says that they considered that infants did not face no future at all. Infants with spina bifida are terminally ill. They will die despite the actions that doctors might undertake and are in a valueless state of existence and that they will spend their lives in pain and suffering. If you see these videos, it does not appear to me that any of these persons in the, in the video are suffering. Uh, they have reached a life which is full of meaning and joy. And when there was a survey conducted on a number of these patients in their adulthood, most of them actually declared that they were leading significant lives and that they would have regretted to have their life terminated uh, at birth. So this is a very important paper. I highly commend you to look into it. I think Rob de Jong has, is, is also a champion in ethics relating to spina bifida. Every single one of you should go and look this up. Very important paper, a lot of ethical uh, things related to spina bifida. So individual responsibility and initiative must be fostered. Yes, you should commend everybody to take folate acid, but we should never do this at the cost of disregarding the vulnerability created by illness and social disadvantage. We should try to help every single one of these kids in, in every single spot of the world. And this is a paper that came out early this year uh, by a number of friends, people who have worked that actually underline uh, the valuable work of neurosurgery advocacy in folate fortification. How are we impacted by folate fortification? Well, we have less severe and more infrequent cases of neural tube disease. We have uh, a better outcome of anatomical and functional level. We have no lumbar kyphosis. We less need to shunt hydrocephalus. We have less need to treat Chiari at birth. And all of these resources can be spent elsewhere uh, in, in children. So it is a multifactorial uh, and constant communication between disciplines, uh, which also impact everybody else. And because of this, I think I have made a, a, a good case for folate. And if someone has to debate, I think it's one, two, that he's facing this pit now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, fantastic lecture. We have already some questions, uh, but we will discuss at the end. Now uh, we will listen uh, one to you. My turn. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody, for this opportunity to talk, um, to be here tonight and to debate Adrian who, as you can see, has been so eloquent that I actually don't know what to say. Um, okay, because he's brought a look point and you can see I even started with this conflict interest that I have no interest to declare, except that this is a debate and I'm asked to speak on a position which may and or may not represent my full uh, personal views and you know when Adrian start talking about the ethics of uh, the treatment of uh, um, patients with myelomeningocele, all right? I have to agree with him. Remember, this is a debate. And actually, this debate is not about whether you treat children with myelomeningocele or not. It's a debate about whether you should fortify cereals with folic acid. And the topic says that it is absolutely necessary, needed. 
And I'm trying to try, I will tell you in the next few minutes why I don't think it is uh, necessarily so. I have to agree with Adrian's introduction about the burden of neurotube defects. And it is probably one of the most devastating uh, uh, disability that children can have. And actually, I'm, at the same time, I must congratulate Adrian and his team for really making, um, you know, looking after these children and making them well. So that actually, in my view, especially the treated patients that we see today, many of them are really very bright, very smart, and you see them, you know, in their wheelchairs, playing games and so forth, right? I think there are actually other neurosurgical conditions that are probably worse. For instance, if I give you a child with hydroencephaly, where there's virtually no brain except water in the brain. And, and you know, these children will never grow up, they'll never walk, they'll never talk, and, and but they still grow. And they are really, really bad. And I remember the days when I was a medical student and we had children with hydrocephalus in one of the wards. These are all children with big heads who could never really walk or uh, enjoy life. So there are other things. But there are a few points to consider uh, based on what Adrian has said. Um, what about the results of fortification? He shows on results. Why do fortification not always work? How does folic acid actually prevent uh, neurotube defects? Is there too much folic acid after fortification? And what are the concerns about too much folic acid? And, and are there any other ways to prevent neurotube uh, defects rather than just uh, fortification? And he has already told us about the, the history of how forti uh, foli uh, fortification began. First started when it was noted that women with a neurotube defects actually were no noted to have low levels of folic. And then there were subsequent small trials in, uh, on the women who had a neurotube affected pregnancy. Right? And then the start of the preconceptional supplementation with 0.4 to 5 milligrams folic acid. And it was actually shown to reduce the incidence of neurotube uh, defects by fourfold. And notice it's very conceptional supplementation, not fortification. And then there were the trials, the MCR vitamin trials, right, which was a large multi institutional double trying placebo controlled randomized trial, which showed a 72 reduction, as we knew. Uh, and again, this was based on very conceptional folic acid supplement, and then subsequent trials in Hungary and another trial in China. But then, as what um, Adrian mentioned, you know, very conceptional uh, folic was thought to be insufficient because people did not plan their pregnancies well. And so the, in, the US was the first country to introduce mandatory fortification of bread flour with folic acid in 1988. Canada followed countries in South America, South Africa, Australia, several other countries. Now, it's, you should note that actually the neurotube rates, uh, defect rates, were already falling in many of these countries before they, the introduction of mandatory fortification. But the authorities still decide to fortify to ensure a more favorable folic status to women who became pregnant. And as was noted, no European countries, including the UK, which is already out of Europe, have actually implemented food fortification. And again, an updated study to show the number of countries in the world that actually have fortified their food, mostly wheat flour alone, but then in some cases, uh, maize, as was mentioned, and only one country in the world, uh, Papua New Guinea, with uh, rice. Now, what were the results that people were getting after fortification? Right? As mentioned, this is a study from Costa Rica, Costa Rica. Uh, this was uh, from 1915, obviously the updated one showed that there was a 50% uh, decrease in the prevalence of neurotube defects from the pre-fortification period to the post-fortification period. Chile, also a 55 reduction between 1999 and 2009. In the USA though, um, a after, immediately after fortification, the birth uh, prevalence actually declined and then actually for the period of 1999 to 2011, there were about estimated 1,326 uh, 1, you know, tube live births that were prevented annually. Right? Of this, about uh, one third were anencephalies, and then two thirds were spina bifida. 
Now, if you look at the chart that was provided, and if you just co focus on um, spinal bifida, and I summarize it here, you'll find that actually the reduction rate in patients with uh, uh, prenatal ascertainment, meaning that they were follow up antenatally, was actually 30, only 38.4%, not 50, 55. If you consider those that without prenatal ascertainment, it was even worse, right? Less than uh, around 20%. If you count the actual cases, it was only about 17%. And then you look at uh, this paper from New Zealand, which actually says that the estimate numbers were actually very few, like an 8% reduction in the annual uh, rate. So when we look at worldwide prevalence, and again, these numbers are, um, you know, really probably pick out the rule because the real thing is that the prevalence rate varies considerably by geographical, geographical areas, by ethnicity. So like in one part of China in 2003, there were actually 14 per thousand. In the US, about 0.7. Uh, in the Netherlands, 1.5. I think it's not anti, the neural tube, the effect prevalence is actually not a very reliable estimate of incidence because a lot of these are only based on live births and stillbirths and not pregnancy terminations. Even in countries that do not, where pregnancy terminations or abortions are not legal, you do not know how many patients actually go for uh, abortions. And therefore, the numbers are never 100% accurate. So looking at what's happening, especially in the uh, US and in the developed countries, the claim that half of all the new tubes could be prevented by main tree fortification is actually misleading because the effectiveness of fortification depends on the baseline prevalence of the neurotube defects. And in many countries with a lower prevalence, you get a smaller reduction. And, and I think this is something that you will see as we monitor more and more numbers. And why is that so? There is a so-called flaw effect for folate fortification. Now, what actually is happening so that, you know, we know that there's a signal decrease when you take folate, either fortification or through supplementation. But the prevalence of neotube defect above in these countries actually have now declined at a steady state. Approximately five per 10,000 birth. And if you include in terminations, seven to eight cases per 10,000 births. And this, decline is independent of the amount of folic acid administered. And that's why they call it a flaw effect uh, for folic acid preventable neurotube defects. What he's saying is that not all cases of neurotube defects are preventable by increasing the folic acid intake. Then the relative decline depends actually on the initial neurotube effect rate. And so countries with a neurotube uh, the effect prevalence close to the observed floor will have much smaller reductions in the neurotube defect rates, uh, even if you have a folic acid fortification. And increasing the amount of folic acid in the, by fortification does not really help. Okay. In fact, if you were to increase folic acid intake, then you need to consider the potential adverse effects of fortification on other vulnerable population groups because they will be affected and I'm gonna uh, carry on doing this. Now it's interesting that also while I'm here that Adrian mentioned about the so-called caudalization of the myelomeningosis. In other words, somehow the, the myelomeningosis that we see today are lower and last uh, thoracic myelomeningosis that I, see was, I saw was more than 35 years ago. And um, you know, many of them, the hydrostaff is not so bad, the care is not so bad, even the lesions are not so big. And I think this is the general experience of many of us, even in countries like in Singapore, where we don't have uh, fortification. And I think it's not just folic itself, I think it's generally the improvement in the economic uh, status of most patients around the world. But I might be wrong, okay, that's, okay. And one of the things that we have to consider why there is a flaw effect is actually to look at the etiology of neurotube effects. Right? Most of these are multifactorial. Etiology is multifactorial, interplay of both genetic and environmental factors. Right? Why genetic factors? Because you can see there's a higher recurrence rate in families, there's a preponderance of neurotube effects in monozygotic twins, and there's an association between neurotube effects and ethnicity. 
and environmental factors because there are differences in prevalence in, over time between seasons, between geographical areas, and between social economic status. And then when you look at the list of specific risk factors for new tube defects, you can see a whole list of maternal uh, risks. Right? Those with diabetes insipidus, obesity, who use anti-epileptic drugs such as valproic acid, who consume alcohol during uh, when they're pregnant, those who have progressive tobacco smoke, um, this uh, caffeine consumption even, right? obviously the diet if it's low in choline and betaine and not just uh, folic acid, uh, even cases with uh, maternal hypothermia, is even this paper on parental occupation, and of course the presence of folic uh, receptor antibodies which was uh, mentioned by Adrian. How do folic acid actually prevent the uh, you know, tube effects? It's a, as we know, it's a water-soluble vitamin B present in many green vegetables. The folic acid that's used in uh, for fortification is actually a synthetic version because it's the most stable form of folate, right? And because it has a bioavailability of up to uh, 98%, much more than many of the natural uh, folates uh, in food. And the 5 meter tetrahydrofolate is the physiological active form of folic acid because uh, it's the one that's involved in the transfer of one carbon moieties necessary for purine and pyrimidine synthesis. And if you look at this chart, how folic acid in this place uh, here enters the uh, metabolism, right? And then of course, these are the, uh, the, the, the uh, how the one meter transfer is concerned. Basically, right, the five meter becomes the tetrahydrofolate, folate and then they give a uh, one carbon moiety to this group here, right? And also note that also there's a mitochondria uh, chain that comes from a formate that actually goes in. So, and these are the enzymes that actually are uh, uh, affected by the uh, uh, genetic changes. Right? And there are folic receptors along the way. Right? So basically the 5 meter folate is uh, transported in cells using by either folate carrier or by an endocytic process made by one or two folic receptors. It's been shown that actually the folate receptor 1 or alpha is expressed in the neurophores of neurulation. And knockout of this gene in the mouse leads to the formation of neurotube defects. So obviously showing the importance of folate uptake to proper uh, neurotube development. And it's been shown also that high doses of folic acid are able to partially rescue this phenotype in this particular knockout mouse. So basically, it's also been shown that yes, folic acid can reduce incidence of uh, new tube effects by up to 70%. And uh, most women with a pregnancy complicated with new tube effect actually do not have clinical folic deficiency. So the protective effect of folic acid supplementation is not dependent on a pre-existing overt maternal folic deficiency. Hence, it's likely that genetic defects in folate metabolism or transport may actually account for variation in individual susceptibility to neurotube defect affected pregnancies. And so gene polymorphisms in uh, folate transporters, folate pathway enzymes have been identified, but again, no conclusive evidence that these genetic differences affect folate status. So when you take all this together, basically folic acid appears to be a corrective rather than a causal factor in the etiol pathogenesis of new chip effects. And the underlying mechanism which folic acid exerts its protective effects have remained elusive. Now, in the practice of medicine, it's unusual to claim that a treatment is safe just because it is effective in treating or preventing one condition. But unfortunately, this is what people have been saying about folic acid fortification. Objective evidence is needed on overall safety and the side effect profile in all people exposed to the treatment and not only to those who benefit. And I think this is very clear. But what's not clear is why is it that people are pushing for this folic fortification? There are limits. Okay? We talk about the uh, flaw effect, right? And that increasing the intake of folic acid will not lower the prevalence. And we need to understand that for every new tube defect that is prevented, uh, by mandatory fortification of flour products, many, several hundred thousand, will be exposed to high folic acid. 
And we must remember, folic acid is a synthetic form of folate, not widely found in nature. And there are now increasing evidence to suggest that certain subgroups of population may be harmed by exposure to high levels of folic acid. And some of the most consistent evidence, unfortunately, leads to the older people. They're trying to save the young right, and make the older people suffer, it seems. One other thing that we need to talk about is actually how much folic acid are actually people taking. If you are fortifying the, 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 the flour, how much you're taking. So from 1998 in the US onwards, right, uh, there was fortification. It was projected that there'll be an increased uptake of about 10 micrograms per day for folic acid as a result of fortification. There was a 2002 study uh, it showed that among non-supplement users, mean people who don't take extra supplement, folic acid intake increased by a mean of 190 micrograms per day, meaning that there was a two-time increase in the amount of folic acid that they were taking. Then when, you, when they look at those who were already taking some form of vitamin supplement, the total folic acid increased to a mean of 3 to 3 microgram per equivalent, which is like at least a three-time increase. So at the same time, what it means is the prevalence of folic intake above the safe upper limit of 1,000 micrograms per day increased almost 10 times. So that's a lot. And the next question you have to ask is, is consuming too much folic acid safe? Well, a high intake of folic acid has been associated with a faster rate of cognitive decline and anemia in elderly patients, especially those with a poor vitamin B12 status. Right? And then, of course, you need to think, as was mentioned earlier, what's the role of folic acid on cancer progression and recurrence? We all know that methotrexate, an antifolic, anti-metabolic drug, is a potent anti-cancer drug. And it was discovered after it was found that the administration of folic acid worsened leukemia. Now, Adrian said that it does not increase the number of patients with leukemia. No, it doesn't. Right? But if you have leukemia, you probably present if you're taking a lot of folic acid, you probably present in a worsened state. And then, so talking about high folic acid intake, anemia, and cognitive decline, there was a Chicago study where older people who consumed more than 340 micrograms total folic acid a day had a faster rate of cognitive decline over six years than those who consumed less than 221 uh, micrograms of folic per day. And further, those who took daily supplements containing more than 400 micrograms of folic acid showed significant cognitive decline compared with non-supplement users. And then there was another study that found that after mandatory fortification in the US, those with poor vitamin B12 status but high serum folate had an increased risk of anemia or cognitive impairment or both, which seemed to be related to the presence of an unmetabolized folic acid in circulation. There was also a study in Australia that showed that older people with high blood cell folate and low vitamin B12 status showed an increased, re an increased risk of cognitive impairment. Even those with low normal B12 but high red blood cell folate had an increased risk of impairment. So that's, what about folic acid and cancer? Now we know folic is involved in nucleotide synthesis. Folate deficiency affects primarily rapid dividing tissues like the GIT, hemopoietic cells, and tumors. And the administration of folic has been observed to enhance the growth of existing tumors. Hence, folic metabolism has been a promising target for anti-cancer drug design. And of course, we became aware of methotrexate, uh, which was a folic antagonist since the 1940s. And the increased need by proliferating tissues for folate also explains why microcytic anemia it's one of the clinical manifestations of folate deficiency. So there is actually a dual role of folate in carcinogenesis. There's increasing body of evidence to suggest that folate plays a dual role, involving both the prevention of early lesions, right? so high folate can reduce cancer, but it can cause potential harm once pre-neoplastic lesions have developed. So observational studies suggest that high folate intake reduces cancer risk. Especially malignancies of the colon, pancreas, esophagus, stomach, and possible cervix and breast. So fortification may be good, but it can also promote the growth of existing cancers. And there's initial experimental studies suggest that folic supplement can enhance the carcinogenic progression of uh, memory tumors. So in the light of what I've just highlighted, should we still fortify? Because remember, this debate is not about treating 
myelomeningus is about fortification per se, right, to prevent narrow tube defect. And so I say fortification of cereals with folic acid is not absolutely needed for prevention of open inner tube defects. There are alternatives to fortification, right? We talk about very conceptual uh, supplement with folic acid. So giving folic acid for a short time. And you can also try to fortify with non-folic acid nutrients that are related to the U1C metabolism that provides once you need things such as uh, the methyl donors, such as choline, betaine, methanone, which also associated with decreased risk for neurotube effects. Remember the mitochondrial uh, part of the folic acid metabolism, uh, where you have the formation of a calcium formic, it can be used as a supplement, right? That is because it's a central importance process of new tube defect because it also helps to provide the one C. And then of course, there's a small study that showed supplement in its store, right? And also small dose of folic acid shown to prevent subsequent new tube defects in mothers with previous new tube pregnancy. And there are also many other things that we as neurosurgeons can do. How often do we stress the use of very conceptual folic acid in countries that don't have fortification to a mother of a child who already it has a myelomeningos seal, a patient that we look after. How often do we tell the mother, you know, consider very uh, conception of folic acid? And of course, one of the things that we have to do is to avoid prescribing the folic acid as an epileptic drug to young women. And so, fortification of cereal, the folic acid is not actually needed for the prevention of open tube defect. Thank you. And here you go. I won. Uh, just a few words. Uh, uh, for the, uh, no, Singapore is supposed to host the uh, 48 annual meeting of ISBN in October. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we have had to postpone it and it's going to be postponed. Uh, it's not cancelled. And there's a very good chance that we will be combining this meeting together with the World Congress on Neuroendoscopy. And so hopefully, you know, we'll have a much bigger group of people coming once to Singapore next year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Excellent debate, excellent information. We have Adrian that tell us is mandatory to fortificate food to prevent uh, myeloma ningocele, spina bifida patient, an encephalian, encephalocele. And we have one that tell us that maybe is not necessary, not mandatory to do supplementation. I would like to, to talk with you, maybe uh, want you uh, just to consider that the second option to uh, prevent spina bifida is to focus on uh, the mother that will be uh, pregnant soon. Uh, just by experience, uh, 10 years giving uh, this class to the medical student, uh, this malformation uh, special uh, lecture. And all of them are aware that uh, how they can prevent, but no of them are taking folic acid because there is a gap between theory. We know that need to be done but it doesn't do like a human being. Why I'm telling uh, this story? Because uh, half of the pregnancy are not uh, planned. We know, but uh, several, for the several papers, I would like to uh, listen about, you, uh, about your opinion on this and after we turn to, to Adrian. But congratulations, it was fantastic uh, conference, both of you. Well, you know, so I, I live in a country that doesn't have um, uh, fortification. Um, but I think it all depends on society, um, you know, because I know that there are a lot of people, young people who actually also just take vitamins because they're easily available. Um, and, and many vitamins actually have not folic. Um, I think it's not easy. I mean, that's the reason why, uh, as Adrian said in his numbers and why the U.S. moved to uh, fortification, even though the numbers of uh, neurotube defects were already declining before that. And because basically they say that people don't plan their, uh, plan their pregnancies. Um, again, 
maybe the the problem is actually we're not pushing it enough you know um, you know we're not educating people enough and also i think in many countries like even in singapore i see more uh, antenatal cases than i actually see real births because uh, there are many patients who actually uh, abort their child and, and, and actually all depends on certain countries like in my in our country right um, you can legally abort a child less than 24 weeks of uh, pre uh, pregnancy and the antenatal service that looks after all these pregnant women you know they will start screening all these uh, mothers very young so so in fact unless they have, have very strong religious belief a lot of actually women will abort their mother many go see children i mean recently i had a, a lady that actually had a uh, on ultrasound and even at later on MRI showed to have a it, it seemed to me more like a meningal seal because there was a stop but the, the mother still decided to abort it even though I told her the prognosis was good so I think uh, if we start education we probably have to start younger but I agree that it's not as effective sometimes I think somehow you need to motivate that's why I felt that one of the things that we have to do as neurosurgeons is if we treat a mother a child with a myelomeningal seal, we actually have to tell the mother the next time you want to have another child, please consider taking folic acid. Now, it's cheap and it's very easily available. Don't take it because you see, most pregnant women will take folic acid, but they take it after they have noted to be pregnant. And that's given by the obstetricians because uh, more for the uh, anemia than anything else. So it's, it's not an easy problem. I mean, that's why one of the things I, I said was, you know, and then I think the use of folic, I don't know about, see, like in our part of the world, more people eat rice than uh, flour. I mean, they still do. And um, I, I said, like I say, one country, I don't know of any other place where they actually add folic acid to rice. You know, would that taste good? I have no idea. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind uh, the participants that we have a chat, you can uh, do your question and we will transmit to the, the speakers. And for you, Adrian, uh, just one question. Uh, you shows that uh, the decrease of uh, spina bifida patient with uh, supplementation, it was uh, evident. My question is, did you believe that it's only about fortification or is a multifactorial uh, factors on it? Maybe the, uh, all the nutrition is better, other factors uh, came together to, to see this decrease of incidence in myelomeningocele patients in your country specifically. Well, Nelsie, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, as you saw in the slide that I showed, uh, economics play a big factor. And of course, we uh, do not know the real incidence of spina bifida in very impoverished countries such as in Africa, because it's really hard to collect evidence and to know exactly what the incidence is, how many kids of these are born over there. Um, but all I can say is that we, we're um, already having very, very stable, actually we were in a very stable economic status before we began fortification and we were still having big numbers. And then afterwards, this drop was actually so in two times, you know, in over two years, the drop was very, very evident that even if we had a high standard of nutrition, even if we had, you know, a good economical um, environment, you know, such as in, in the case of one two and ourselves, it is no secret that um, the, the quality of life and the income per capita in, in both countries are high. But all I can say is that it was very evident, you know, over two years, we saw these, these decrease, which was radical. So to me, that was, not just an observational effect. And these numbers kept not only going down, but have maintained themselves over the last 20 plus years. So to me, that's, that's a, big, uh, a big statement. Um, I just want to show you uh, a couple of slides that I have left here. 
um, let me share this and, and show you. Um, to, to, to tell you about these objections to fortification, as you know, as, as one two has said, there's an increased cancer risk. And many of, of, of these findings relating to cancer well done in animal studies. Um, but actually, when these were observed, and there's a very interesting article by uh, Sia Shok Liu, which basically shows that mostly in breast, pancreatic, ovarian, and prostate cancer, there was not a significant statistical correlation. And that, yes, if you have a precancerous uh, lesion, uh, of course, low levels of folate actually increase the risk of having cancer in this lesion. And after you fortify, you can claim that, yes, you could actually increase the chances of um, you know, activating these tumors. But now we have settled that there is actually a, an adequate uh, spectrum of fortification which runs in the 200 to 400 micrograms in the general population. So it, it has been proven to be quite safe, not to overdose or underdose, not only to prevent folic acid-related uh, spina bifida, but also cancer in general. Um, so I think that's, that's something to, to mention. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. And um, we have several uh, panelists here, which are very prominent in, in this area. Um, I see that Professor Oakley is among the, the participants. He is a very strong voice of fortification. He's collaborated with the CDC over many years from Georgia. So um, I think there's, there's a very strong case for fortificating. I have, before I uh, go to the chat, I will need your help afterwards for uh, Sandy because I go out on the conference and goes back. Some of the questions are missing on my uh, question and answer. Uh, yeah, before, I do that, Nancy, I'll ask the questions, but before I do, I have a question for both the panelists. You see, okay. I mean, my take on this so far has been that uh, fortification, as Adrian showed, has certainly impacted the incidence of neural tube defects. Perhaps I, I saw a slide that you very rapidly went uh, over. The, the reduction in encephalocele is not as much as the reduction of neural tube defects, if I, if I got that right. And I'm going to ask you why that is the case. Uh, perhaps you can tell us why the incidence of encephalocele did not reduce as much as the incidence of the meningomyelocele did in your country. But uh, the fundamental point you made was that it's, it's good in, in most countries to fortify because it would reduce the open neural tube defects. Now, really the main point that went you highlighted against this was the fact, number one, was the megaloblastic anemia issue. That if you have vitamin B12 deficiency and you give folic acid, then A, you could uh, unmask the anemia that helps the diagnosis and uh, increase the cognitive impairment. And of course, there's the issue of malignancies, uh, not actually proven in clear-cut studies, but very much uh, a suspicion that you might make things worse. My question is that, have we got selective fortification anywhere? In other words, is, it, is there a scope of, of fortifying and saying this, uh, this uh, rice or this wheat it, it is not meant for the consumption of people over the age of 50 or people who may have a malignant disease? And so you have this uh, fortified cereal available for most people, but you have this uh, little uh, precaution written on it, like cigarette smoking is injurious to health, that type of thing. It is that available? Because that would seem to be the best of both worlds. You could have everybody having the fortification, uh, fortified uh, cereals in, in certain parts of the world where it's very common, for example, the country where I come from. And, and at the same time, you could have a warning to elderly people or people with malignant disease. So there, there is an option of having non-fortified uh, rice or cereal as well. Has anybody done this or is this at all feasible? I'm going to ask both the panelists their opinion on this. Well, at, at least from uh, my research, there are several, way, several ways that are being uh, implemented in order to try to tackle this. One of them 
is what if we feed livestock and uh, for instance why if we uh, feed folate to um, to chicken so they can lay eggs which are high in folate and this is very stable uh, so you basically promote not only folate but the consumption of other vitamins you know vitamin 12 the other the other strategy is that uh, not only you fortify with folate but you also put b12 uh, in in our staples um, but yes i mean there are many opportunities to try to tackle this based on, on the populations that you really want to target. Um, and it must be remembered that fortifying is quite, it's quite cheap. So it shouldn't do a big impact. And it also has been shown that the money that you spent on the machinery used to fortify um, the, the, the campaigns and the advertisements and so on actually pay themselves soon enough. So any, any of these strategies that could be implemented is self payable just out of prevention of, of, of a couple, you know, of a few of these cases. One, two? One, two? Well, I mean, one of the reasons why I think my, uh, the encephalocils, uh, you know, are less because basically encephalocils, at least I, my understanding is they are not neuralation defects. They're actually post neuralation defects. So basically, that's why uh, folate will not actually have an effect on the incidence or will reduce their incidence. As far as the, um, uh, you, what you would you say is uh, selective fortification, I think it works the other way around. I think in, in many, like in our country, a lot of bread that's so actually has vitamins fortified inside the bread. So, so in other words, you add it to people who are willing to buy it rather than, you know, wholesale put it. But I, I mean, your idea is good, but then, you know, you have a family with young people and old people. How do you cook two pots of rice or make two different types of bread? So that may not be so simple. I mean, it's very easy. And, and there are also, I think, Frank, when I was doing my reading, that there are actually, uh, especially like uh, in Europe, there, there are actually, uh, you can buy specially fortified flour, for instance. So, so as, as what uh, Adrian said about, you know, flour in the U.S. that's sold to Latinos that do not have fortification. Actually, they in some of the other countries, there are actually uh, uh, millers and all that that actually sell flour with fortification. So th those are things that, you know, are probably available. Does that help you answer your question? It's whether, whether the family buys them or not. But don't forget, for, for late, actually, as I mentioned, is actually present in quite a lot of food, you know, the beans, legumes, uh, green vegetables and so forth. So it's, it's, I, I think it's a dietary issue really. I mean, I'm sure you eat a lot of lentils because you know, that's uh, in part of the diet. So you probably won't have an issue, but you still see unfortunately patients with, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, in your population, there's still myelomenic seals and all that. Okay, um, Nelsie, you need to take the questions and ask them the questions from the chat box. But th just on this uh, note, there is an interesting question from Dr. Saida who says that if you have a problem with patients who have vitamin B12 deficiency, as you said, giving them folic acid, then why not um, fortify with both B12 and folic acid together? Would well, that would uh, take care of the cognitive defects and would give you the advantages of folic acid? Uh, yeah, but ask the governments why they're not doing it. I'm just uh, answering the debate, <laughs> but I think it's a good idea. But my question is, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you can come in. Yes, uh, just a supposition, but you, both of you are the Minister of Health in your uh, country, and you have a budget. My question is, how you advise the President to spend your, your resources fortifying food, or uh, try to do a public campaign and target of uh, the women in childbearing age. It's for both of you, because apparently you have different position in the same subject. Okay, I would like to say that one of the things that happens with uh, public health, uh, you know, universal health system such as in my country is that we have 
a very hard time trying to determine the cost. You know, since everything is covered and it's free, we basically have a, a really hard time. But once you start looking into the numbers, once you realize the expenditure that is taken into every single of these kids, I think we need to be advocators. We need to, you know, and, and this is one of the things that Jeff Lowe has uh, underlined in his work that we should uh, speak openly about this. Um, and it's a matter of political will. Uh, many years ago, as you might remember, uh, at one of the Latin American meetings uh, that was held in Brazil, we all undersigned the letter. This, this was called uh, the letter of um, Recife. Uh, and this declaration said that every single country in Latin America should fortify. And we were, I would say, to my regret that we have not been so successful in many countries. Uh, the Ministry of Health would even say that why would we want to take away uh, spina bifida? Then we would have nothing to work upon, right? That this, this was a true statement. No, believe me, this was a statement from a Minister of Health. So you would start thinking, if this is the people who I'm dealing with, why, how am I going to convince them? So I think we need to be advocators. We need to come out to the light and show the, the data and the facts and, and underline the importance of, of preventing uh, these, uh, these defects that certainly can be prevented by implementing not only B, uh, not only folate, but B12 and, and, and many other things that we can correct in nutrition overall in, in, in our populations. Want to? You are the Minister of Health and you have the resource of your country in your hands. What's your policy? Well, good question. Having read what I've read, um, okay, so in, in, in this country, in Singapore, I probably would not because I think people here are rich enough, people take a lot of vitamins and that stuff, right? Um, and I think the, the, the um, because I think the concern, because we do have a aging population, and if you start putting in folic, uh, you know, the risk of all this uh, highlighting up the anemia, cognitive decline, you know, possibly making cancer worse, can be a big problem. Right? And, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not minister. <laughs> I don't, never will. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it, I, but it is not an easy uh, thing. I mean, if you look at Europe, for instance, I mean, Europe is supposed to be one. I mean, the Europeans are most one of the most enlightened group of people. They were all well educated, and yet, you know, uh, not a single European country actually has for, uh, compulsory fortification. There are a lot of papers uh, coming up in the U in the UK, for instance pushing for um, uh, fortification, but you know, nothing's been done. And, and they were one of the earliest country that actually started uh, in the late uh, early 70s. And we're talking about you know, 50 plus years and still no fortification. So there's a lot of issues that, you know, I don't think we can just uh, touch. But I think it's, if there's no fortification, I think we should seriously push very uh, conceptual supplementation. That, that's something that, uh, you know, it's not difficult to do, uh, but as you say, whether how effective it is because people don't plan a pregnancy. I was reading the papers and there was also even in, in some places at one time, they were actually putting in folic acid in the, uh, the pill because they thought that these people who take the pill, at least they'll put them, fill themselves up with uh, uh, folic acid so that uh, when they stop the pill to get pregnant, they will have some degree of <laughs> uh, falling in the blood. So, so I mean, there, there are a lot of ideas out there, right? And definitely, you know, we probably, if you want to, fortification is just one way of doing it. I think there are other ways, although yes, it's a good and cheap way as Adrian has shown. Um, but I think there also will be a lot of uh, people who are against it on the basis of, you know, what I actually presented because I, I when I look at a subject, was asked to look at subject, I realized that actually there were very strong papers out there against fortification. And that was what I put in this talk. 
Uh, what you read is a question about uh, uh, on the, the chat, Tiago Wesher. There is some relationship with uh, folate intake and autism uh, at the moment. Yeah, I came across a couple of papers uh, relate, talking about you know for the increase for taking folate and the risk of autism, but I don't think there's a lot of evidence there. The problem with autism is something so you know. It's, it's, there are many, many, many causes and, and some of this could, you know, just that because you take extra folic acid and all that may not be the main thing. I, I don't think there's a direct causal effect, not like what we've seen for some of the others. I think the evidence is not very clear yet. That's why I didn't put it in my talk. Okay, thank you. There is a question to Adrian from Anastasia Arincina. How many women did you uh, sample see uh, for uh, their baseline blood folate level in 1999? At least uh, the percentage to have this data. Elsie, I don't have the number right now, but it was very representative and it was a significant number. So okay. uh, it, it was designed in order to, you know, to be representative. Uh, but I don't have the number on, on the top of my head now. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Jeff Blount, who's of course, Jeff is one of the big advocates of um, fortification. And Jeff says that there are three options. Either you fortify or you terminate the pregnancy when you see there's an open neural tube defect or you do nothing. Is there any study looking at the impact in the lives of the women that have terminated their pregnancy after they've found an open neural tube defect? Does that enter into this equation in any way? Either of you can answer that. I mean, is there a study looking at women that have terminated their pregnancy because they've discovered the open neural tube defect? Is that something, the impact in the lives of these women that there's the psychology, the physiology that uh, should enter into the equation when we're saying that uh, you have countries where if you're diagnosed with an open neural tube defect, you can simply uh, abort. I was uh, trying to look at the data that came out from Germany and the Netherlands um, because I thought probably recollection would be more strict, but uh, I couldn't come across uh, something in, in, in this matter. Have you want to? No, actually, because uh, like for instance, uh, so termination of pregnancy data, health data is actually very sensitive. You cannot just uh, get access to it. In fact, even in our standard medical records, those are off limits to everybody else. So it's impossible to actually do that unless you have special permission. Now, so, so actually in Singapore, I mean, there is a probably a certain percentage of uh, patients who uh, women who actually have termination of pregnancy for many, many reasons. I mean, actually, I think the presence of a minor seal, uh, at least on seeing on MRI or CT or ultrasound, is actually a very small number compared to what is. And I don't think there's actually any research done. Like I say, a lot of people will not because it's, sens it's a very sensitive information. And if you want to do research in the area, you're probably going to be very hard pressed to get. But speaking to the, uh, so I've had a few patients that. Obviously, you know, they come to us for antenatal counseling and you can see that the people who are, uh, who subsequently go for uh, termination of pregnancy, um, they are, they, they, I don't know how to say it, but I think sometimes you can tell that they have, this woman is probably going to have it. And I think it's got to do with also religious background and, uh, you know, how they feel, where they are in their career, how many children they've had already. And also sometimes you can see the husband's the one that's side pushing it and so forth. So I think there are, there are many, many things. It's not possible based on the small number that I've seen to, to actually tell you exactly what it is. But of course, I, as someone actually asked, which I answered um, by text, that actually the other thing, of course, that is also term, I mean, uh, termination as a form of birth control, which used to be pretty popular in times, actually is something quite devastating to the women as far as future pregnancies are concerned. And no matter what you say, I'm sure there is also a psychological impact. Uh, Sandeep and Nelsie, 
I would like to ask in my defense as a Titan, uh, the biggest backup I can think of, and uh, it's uh, Je uh, Geoffrey Oakley who is within the panel. So I think he's keen to say a few words about this. I think it's very important to hear what he has to say. Uh, perhaps Linda can grant him uh, access to the, so as a panelist. I'm actually trying to do that. We haven't been successful yet. And somehow Professor Rookley's chat maybe, box. Maybe uh, now, is it open? Hello? Yes. Brilliant. Yes, it's open. So first I want to say what an amazing, wonderful um, uh, meeting this has been. I, I really congratulate the two presenters. They're just fantastic. I think it's just wonderful. I'd like to make comment primarily about B12 and the call to your attention, a really wonderful paper written by R.J. Berry in the last year or so in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And the take home message from that is that folic, folic acid does not affect in any way the natural history of B12 deficiency, including causing any risk. And although all of us who've been to medical school have been taught that, it's sim simply a fiction of some misunderstandings in the early days. And so I, I, I encourage you all to read that. Um, and the alternative to me is that I think gets missed when people worry about folic acid and B12. They don't work on the real problem. And the real problem is that there is B12 deficiency in the world. Dr. Oakley? We stop hearing Professor Oakley. Are you still listening to him? No, I cannot listen to him. Maybe he got... The internet connection, maybe. Yeah, he maybe can we'll be back wait soon. Yes. To get to re establish his connection. Meanwhile, there is an interesting question from Dr. Nakwi which I'll pose to you. It says, why are we talking only about fortifying cereals? Is it possible to fortify water? <laughs> Good question. Why not sugar and salt? Universal. I know there was an attempt to fortify sugar in Brazil, right? And the Congress did not pass this law. Um, Just one question about sugar I read. I'm not sure that is true, but it was because sugar is uh, well utilized in the sweet uh, beverage and maybe can change the taste. It was one of the reasons that uh, wasn't uh, passed this intention at that time. Okay, let's right, see. Let's see. We've actually covered all the questions. Is there anything else left? Do you want to cover it with and wind up? Uh, did you see all the questions, uh, Sandeep? On the yeah, more or less. I think we've more or less. covered everything. Okay. One would like to do the question from each other. Oh, well, trying to answer the, 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 the question that was uh, put out by Sandeep. You know, encephalocele in this part of the world is actually not such a big issue. We have low numbers. So perhaps the impact of folate on encephalocele is not as prominent as, as spina bifida. Uh, to my knowledge, I do not know if there has been some study on, on the impact of folate in countries in, in the Far East. I, I understand that Thailand and some of your neighboring countries have actually an abnormally high incidence of encephalocele. Okay. So do some parts of my own country. This is why I asked the question, in fact. So it would be very interesting to see what happens there. Yeah, like I say, the, the problem is, I think embryologically, it's not a uh, neurotube defect, not an open neurotube defect. That's why it may not work in that area. I mean, I remember reading some of your theories about, you know, like in Burma, one, someone said that it was probably the, uh, the mole in the uh, rice that because of the dam and all that, and then some sort of uh, toxins being produced and so forth. But I don't think uh, 
we really got an answer. There was a paper written by uh, one of our colleagues uh, from the Netherlands uh, many, many years ago. I can't remember exactly what is now uh, talking about it being slightly different as well. So uh, I personally don't think that it's related to <laughs> uh, neurotube defect. That's why it may not work. And it seems yeah. to be present only in certain so-called ethnic, ethnic groups. So basically the um, into Chinese group of people, so the Thai, Thai Filipinos, um, Vietnamese, Malays, and so forth, which is the, a different group from the Chinese and the Indians as well, generally. Uh, just some words. Uh, we are talking about different countries and different realities. I think if we are talking about a country like Costa Rica, Brazil or Latin America, most of the countries are not allowed to do termination of pregnancy. Uh, and uh, in our reality, I think we can't uh, put the question not fortifying folic acid uh, at the moment because we have decreased these incidents. In Brazil, uh, it was proven 10 years before and 10 years after the law uh, by fortification into us in 2004, uh, decreased more than 20% the incidence of myeloma was here. We give credit to fortification, even though can be other, uh, other uh, factors on it. But if we are talking uh, about a country that you are allowed to terminate pregnancy, you have other uh, possibility to talk about uh, health uh, system uh, prevention or treatment. I think both reality are different and maybe we can have different policy for each country. Professor okay, so Godfrey Oakley are with us. Are you I'm listening to us? I, I, I hear you. I'm so sorry. I got bumped off. I don't know what happened. Um, you but come my back in time. Yeah. So my, my main point is that with B12, we need to think a little bit more about that. And I encourage you to look at, at R.J. Berry's paper. And for me, the remaining problem is we really need to pay attention to how do we find undiagnosed and untreated pernicious anemia. We'll talk about that at another time. As far as whether you could put enough B12 in flour to solve the, um, uh, the, the, the pernicious anemia problem, you simply can't do that. You, would, you know, the dose you use would be pretty high. But what you could do, and we are dreaming about having a screening program in countries that already have B12 uh, in the flour, and anybody left with B12 deficiency is highly likely to have uh, pernicious anemia, even if they're not sick yet. And so like finding somebody who's HIV positive before they get AIDS, we might be able to identify on a national basis pernicious anemia before people get sick and then give those people a high dose of folic B12, which would in fact solve their problem. That is the real problem. And the second thing, I'm not sure if you heard, but I'm really, really excited about the possibility of, I, of putting folic acid into iodized salt. Almost everybody in the world has access to iodized salt. And it is so cheap and so simple to do. And what one does is the bucket of water that you put the iodate in, you put some folic acid and some bar bicarbon there and stir it up and nothing else has to be done. It's an absolute miracle. We're working on that particularly in Ethiopia where they have a raging, raging epidemic. And if it, it works there, we'll have an enormous, uh, the, the, defects will, the defects will just go away, most of them. And then on the timing of this, R.J. Berry also did this wonderful study that showed if you use folic acid in multiple dosing schedules and daily amounts, that it, by three months, you reach maximum blood folate levels. So that's another thing that's so good about this, is that when you get it done, it begins to work almost immediately. So within a year, you, you, if you had full fortification everywhere, you'll, you'll have the effect and it'll just be magnanimous. And nobody's actually done that in a year that like Ethiopia, really nice to see Ethiopia go from a from 100 for 10,000 to even 10 for 10,000 be a you know, huge, huge uh, uh, drop. So I hope we'll see that and, and they can add more enthusiasm to this. And I finished with saying, if any of you would like to help me get the Rotarians of the world interested in this problem. You've got a friend that's a Rotarian, want to work on that, please uh, give me an email or a phone 
and Jeff Blunt can help you with my email address and my phone numbers. And I'm happy to work with anybody in any country that would like to do that because I believe we could get them to take this on as they finish polio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandy? Great. I think that brings us to the end of this fantastic debate. It's, I've really learned a hell of a lot from this debate. I, I'm sure you have as well. And just to remind you, uh, to, as we end, that the next Clash of the Titans is scheduled for the first Friday in July, which happens to be the 3rd of July. And if Linda now shows you, that's the contest. Bony decompression alone is enough for symptomatic Chiari malformation with syrinx in a child of 10 years. In case you don't recognize the two individuals on that uh, poster, <laughs> that's Professor Dominic Thompson from the Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children in London and Professor Gian Piero Tamburini from Rome in Italy. They've promised to be better dressed than they are on the poster during the debate. So when <laughs> Professor Ash is single, moderates this debate. Please do check in. Have a great day, morning, afternoon, evening or night.